Welcome to the Tom Castro Shooting Academy podcast. You have now entered the next level. What's going on, everybody? All right, I have a brand new podcast for you coming to you. I have a special guest, Mr. Matty Hopkins. How's it going? What's up, Matt? Good, really brother. Well. Good. All right. So, Matt's joining me. We actually stayed at the same house at Nationals for the Handgun Nationals. Ironside and- Nationals. Oh, that's right. Iron Sights Nationals. <laughs> Let's look at the patch you got, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did I, I don't know. Did I pick up a patch? I don't think I did because I usually throw them away. So I don't waste them. <laughs> <laughs> but I did go at one of those sweet, free, free jerseys. Oh, the, the shirts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, going to start it off spicy already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Matt and I stayed at the same place, uh, same house. And, um, we, we got to talk to each other every day after the match and actually shot on the same schedule. So he shot the stage behind us and we were in the same zone. So it was really nice because we were able to kind of talk a little bit about every single day about how the match went for each other. The difference was, is I was shooting a lot of bullets with a <laughs> beautiful, beautiful red dot on top with a masterpiece arms firearm. And Matt was shooting 10 rounds <laughs> and iron sights yeah. and iron sights. Yes. that Yeah. Why did you shoot limited optics? 10 rounds. Oh, they even have, I have that yet? this vision for like going to South Africa in 2025. Um, <laughs> I don't know and how much of a vision it is anymore, but yeah, right, yeah. So, you're uh, so you're working for the world shoot then, yeah, trying to get on the world yeah. shoot team. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, do you when you go to world shoot, will you end up with 15 rounds for them or do they stick with the 10? 15. Okay, nice. Yeah. So, before we get on to the nationals, did you do the survey recently? Oh, yeah. Did you fill out for are you? Are you a 15 guy or a 10 guy? So before this survey came out, I was of the opinion of it should be to what the box is limited to. Okay. Now that that's not an option, I choose 15. So what is the box limit you to 10? I mean, you could get no, what, 13, you whatever. Could probably, it was. You could, there's probably some guns I could get 20 in the box maximum. Oh, okay. Uh, so you were good with more rounds. Like the Graham's followers. Yeah. Okay. Like if it fits in the box, that's what you could load to. That that's gotcha. what I thought would be the best idea, but that didn't go anywhere. So that keeps you from worrying about modifications, right? If it's in the box, it's it, whatever the whatever the follower is inside of it. It doesn't matter. It's still in the stock magazine. Well, there's nothing that says you can't change a follower. Put a little like a half 140 base pad on there if you have a gun that it'll work on. I, I'm sure right. there would be some combination out there, but there is a limiting factor on that which is yeah. the overall box size. Right. So did we eliminate the box? No, it's still a thing. You still have to fit your production gun in a box. Okay, gotcha. They're I just gotcha. allowing it to either be 10 or 15, not okay, okay. So they in the box. The only problem, and 10 is pretty easy to count, but 15 is pretty hard to count as an RO. You got to really kind of pay attention at that point. I, c- I don't count, honestly. Yeah. Like when I RO, I just don't count. Yeah. I don't know how many people actually do. I don't have to count because I usually know what they have to shoot in those arrays. So that for me, it's easy. It's like, you can't shoot that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the easiest so, way to do it. Like if you're on a yeah. stage, you kind of, you should be aware of like where people are going to have to reload like revolver or right. single stacker production and like and CO and limited also, they're going to be pretty equivalent. Yeah. Like you can't shoot the whole stage in CO or limited if it's a over 25 round stage. Right. Yeah, or they're or they're cheating on in general. They got the wrong mag in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. sure. There's not a there's not a follower combination in the world. Get me thirty rounds yet. I'm working on it, but no, I'm just right. kidding. I, I'm okay with reloading. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> I would have just switched to uh, open by now if I really hated the reloading part. Um, yeah. So for me, I actually just voted tonight. It's funny that this we had decided to do this tonight, but I just voted tonight to do the fifteen rounds. Um, and honestly, I'm not going to lie. Handgun nationals mm, strayed me to the, fi- pushed me to the 15 very quickly. Um, I've always been a round count guy. It's one of the reasons why I walked away from production in the first place. I, I never really hated irons. I just hated that. I spent the majority of my time with the gun down in my hand, trying to put bullets in it. Um, and that's also happened due to the stage designs that we have really kind of fallen off on stage designs recently with, I, I, I can tell you right now, this match, I would have switched from production to limited minor way before I would have shot production for two reasons. 
one, my lack of practice, and two, <laughs> the fear of a standing reload on every stage and in pure embarrassment. <laughs> there was definitely He's, lots of opportunities uh, to go to Slybok in the same position you were in. Like a it, lot. it was crazy how much pressure they forced you into on an iron sight match. I mean, when you start off drawing on two mini poppers at 30 yards for an array of seven, knowing you're probably going to have at least one makeup shot there. <laughs> oh, dude, in that array? Like, and the play in production was to shoot three minis there, not just two. Yes. So Yeah, there was like, a lot of stages like that, though. That was, was the crazy. There was a target at 30, three mini poppers at 30, and then a target at three yards or something. So yeah, yes. like you had to plan at least like two, maybe three makeups in that, that put you at 10 in that, that position right away. So you're talking about 18, right? The first array on the left. Yeah. Yep. Did you draw on the far target or the close target there? I drew on the burner. I'm not doing shooting double action at 30 yards. dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good. Dude, you could have ricocheted one in lucky or something, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, or shot at the paper and like yanked one into the steel on the left of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that would have, dude. And, and no matter what, you just go plan that. I definitely yep. plan steel first. <laughs> you don't admit to that ever. Yep. <laughs> um, I went to the burner first, also, and I had a single action. <laughs> I just take the safety off. I went to the uh, burner because yeah. I was like, I want my gun in my hand way before I have to aim down there on that far stuff. I saw people trying to take like the hard shots and then like kind of leave on that close one. I'm like, dude, that close one leaning on that one and leaving on that one is not going to determine your score on that stage. <laughs> yeah. No matter what. You didn't what. save anything. Yeah. No. You didn't save anything trying to leave on that target you at take all. One makeup shot. You've lost more time than you tried to. <laughs> yeah. Gain. yeah. Yeah. Cause now you're a standing reload in that position. So yeah. yeah my, uh, Sam Caldwell stayed with us as well. And um, his day one, we started on zone three, which was by far the hardest zone um in 100%, the match yeah not only was it the hardest but it was the most demand I, I think the reason it was the hardest was because it was demanding on anyone who had a lack of rounds right so i had 24 rounds in my gun at the beginning of every stage and even i was like i can't afford a lot of makeup shots here not because i didn't have bullets but because i was like it's gonna just cost me so much extra time and it, I've lost the advantage of having the red dot at that point, right? Like it's, yeah. I'm just wasting away rant rounds. But Sam was a, is a B class production shooter, and his first day, he couldn't get out of his mind that we were not at a normal match. I was like, dude, I want you to understand this entire zone, all six or seven stages we're about to shoot. Maybe there was two in that entire zone that weren't survival. <laughs> well, I think it was like the short stages. They had that where yeah. they had two double bays in the section. Yeah. And, and they were like 16, 14, 12 round stages, double bay. So equivalent, it, like it was six, 30 plus round stages on, yes. on every single bay. Yes. And I think it was more points than any other section by like, 20 or 30 rounds it was a lot it yeah. really it to me to me that was the most disappointing part of nationals for me was that if you started in zone three you were screwed for any kind of comeback or 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 you basically went to the next two zones just hoping that your your scores held up because you knew there was no making up any ground at all on zone one or two at all it was a, literally a stay in the top five and hope to God those guys suck on day three. And it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. There was just too many points in zone three. And coming in on your first, my my first day and your first day were in zone three. So to me, I was like, bro, this shit's hard. If I come in here and try to rip this without any warm up or any really like not understanding how I'm going to shoot this whole match, I'm going to bomb on day one. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to push on the really good, easy moving stages, which I think had three open targets on it. Yeah, they did. They did make all those shots God. pretty difficult. Like they stacked targets with no shoots in between. Like a third of the upper, the lower A zone was available on them. So yeah, they didn't make those targets much easier than the other stages. So there was no reprieve from from just constant hard aiming, right? I I, I think the biggest. Uh, the biggest thing that I disliked 
about the match in general was there was no throttle control. It was just control all the time. Um, even hell, even the, um, the build drill, I was like, don't DQ. <laughs> don't, <laughs> because, DQ uh, don't drop points. Like, yes. Yeah. Just like don't it's DQ. It's not worth it to try to no. do something crazy on that stage. I mean, even the, even the, the standard stage with the, with the turning target, it, I almost DQ'd on that stage. So I was getting to the point where I was like, all right, man, listen, it's day three. It's freaking 40 degrees. The wind's blowing hundred miles an hour over here. I started to reload on my first array and I felt my finger squeeze, like start to go to the tr uh, trigger. And I just let go of the gun, like just, <laughs> and I finished the reload and then shot. And I think I got maybe three rounds off after the reload. Cause I was like, we had already lost two or three top shooters at that match because of that stage with cold weather. And yeah. I wasn't going to DQ after I worked my ass off to get to the top there. I was going to like, I'm not leaving this match over this dumb stage. <laughs> so, I think that was partially due with the weather also, though. It was pretty bad. It was cold. It was cold. It was it freezing was, it cold. Was, it was cold. No other way to say it. Yeah. Coming I, out of the summer and shooting yeah. matches and... I'll be the first one to say I've turned into a, a wimp about cold weather since I moved down <laughs> here to South Carolina. It was 40 degrees when we start, like we got out of the car Saturday morning. Yep. And by the time we got back in the car, it was all the way up to balmy 49 degrees. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's just say I took my jacket off on the, I think it was around, what time do we finish? Do you think 12, 31 uh, o'clock then? 12, probably. Well, 12. All right. So Maybe I think 12, it was 30, like, yeah. I think it was 10 o'clock. I took my jacket off by 10 30, 11. I had to put my jacket back on because the cloud cover, I was like, Oh look, sun for about 30 seconds. Wasn't that on <laughs> Sunday though? No, that was sat. That was Saturday, Saturday? On, in okay. the morning. Cause our morning day our oh, yeah. was freezing cold in the morning. It was cold. And I was excited. Cause I was like, Oh good. Now those guys have to shoot on a cold day on <laughs> zone three. And that didn't happen. It wasn't as cold on Sunday as it was Saturday. So it, it just, it it took me forever to get rolling on Saturday, man. I, I, I think I had one stage where I was like, yeah, like I shot like myself. And then I was like, all right, this sucks. Cause I went right from that stage to, to stage one with a 38 yard <laughs> effing target on it. You know, it's the steel standing surrounding it and that long far left corner target. That stage one was just, you went from, I guess you could say a hoser. There wasn't one at this match, but this one you could move around and like really attack. And then you go to a stage where you're like, okay, if I move two inches to the right or two inches to the left, I'm going to miss the target and not be able to hit it. So it was, it was just, you never could get going in those in zone one and two. It just, it just really kind of killed you in, in gaining points. And I needed some points there for sure. I needed some points. So it was a uh, very frustrating, <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely. I, uh, I think the overall like consensus of the match was it, they were all hard shots. Um, I don't know. I'm conflicted on if I like the match or not. Like I didn't perform well, so I know that's going into my, my thought on how I what I thought of the match. So, and I had more involvement in the match, which we can talk about in a bit. But yeah. Um, I don't know. I think overall it was a little too hard. There was the average target distance was probably too far with the amount of hard cover and stuff like that. Like if there was no hard cover in the match and everything else was the same, I think it would have probably been okay. But there was no reason to put a half Ipsic target at it's 30 yards. <laughs> at, yeah, like 20. I think it was 28, yards. 29 yards. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So I love the match and it's not just because I shot it well. I love the match because I was prepared for the match. So I wasn't prepared for 30 yard shots. Let me, let me clarify <laughs> this. Okay. I was prepared for some 30 yard shots, but not for, I don't know how many rounds was it? 360 something rounds or whatever it was. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Maybe I wasn't, more. I wasn't prepared for 300 or 325 of those rounds. And I'm not exaggerating when I say probably 300 rounds were in the 20 yard plus range. I mean, it was pretty crazy how far that stuff was. Um, and the one good thing about that range is they have the ability to extend their base or range it, the shots. Yeah. Oh yeah. The crazy part is, is if you actually were at the match, you would know this, everybody would know this. 
they had farther they could have went. So let's just, they were probably being nice by not going to the 40 and 50 yard mark because they had a few of those that they could have done and they kind of restrained, I guess, if you want to call it yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but my own, my biggest complaint of the match and, and it's, it's kind of always the same. So I've just kind of learned to just go, cool, man, I'm going to learn to stop and shoot is there's not enough variety. We have this big separation in our sport from the normal level one, level two, hell, even some of the level threes, when you go to an area match, there's always some kind of movement involved, even if it's just one or two targets here and there. And I, I don't mean just like entry targets. I mean, like cool, I can choose to move and shoot on this 20-yard target or 15-yard target or whatever it is. There is none of that in this match. And the ones that they gave you that you could move and shoot, they slap a half Ipsic target on it at 15 yards. Yeah, that's uh, true, yeah. That or one no stage, shoot. like, <laughs> uh, like fifth, no, 16 or something like that, I think, yes. where... 14, where 14 was about, a mover. Yep. Yeah. 14 and 15 were both mover, movable. You could actually move on those two stages. Not just, and I'm not talking about the short stages. I'm talking like an actual really large field course, not just a filler stage, but an actual field course. They just didn't give us like yeah, much at all. 16 was the one I was thinking about. Yes. Everything was probably within 10 yards except for the Indian position. Yes. But they slapped half Ipsic targets up there. Yes. On yep. probably half the targets that were less than 10 yards. Yeah. So they gave, I remember that tar That was the one with the start stick. Yes. I, that you started yeah, with your hands you start up. Okay. In and it's like, yeah. a, it's like yeah. a lightning bolt. Right. And I, and I remember that stage. So I was lucky enough to walk stages with Matt and my buddy, Sam, when we were walking stages and cause Sam was, I shoot with a lot of bullets, obviously, but I started in production. So how I learned how to walk stages and I still break stages down like that was in production. There were stages where I was like, Sam would come over and he's like, man, I don't know about this. I go do an extra reload. And he goes, really? And I go, trust me, you want to take the pressure off in this position yeah. on that. And you were standing here like, that's stupid, but that's probably the way to go. <laughs> like that sucks that we have to yeah. do that. But if we don't, you're guaranteed a standing reload. If you just make one and those, and it was two mini poppers up against the wall, a bobber and all these things. And I'm just like, it sucks, dude. I know, but I would rather have that than a standing reload because that was what was coming. If you're not perfect, yeah, I think that was uh, there was one like that, like stage 21. I think it was where we could have went to 10 in the final position, but it's like shooting a tux, right? And then having to move on mini poppers into a <laughs> yeah. position, <laughs> yeah, shoot a bobber, and then like transition to the left side of the stage yeah. and shoot two more right. ipsic targets at mid range. Yeah. Good range at that point. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, I was I was listening to some other people talk about the match and they were they were talking about and actually it happened with Sam a couple times. We struggled he struggled kind of like, "Bro, I'm going to have a standing reload." I said, "There's no such thing. You don't need one here." And he goes, "What do you mean?" I go, "Okay. I know this sucks, but you're going to have to create a position here." But creating this position, it'll give you the round count, but you're going to have to stop for that even though it's and it's a long target, so you could should probably stop anyway. But he had to stop an extra position because of the round count, which to me is what bothers me the most about stage designs right now. Like we are not, we're putting so much pressure at every nationals I've ever been to for productions. It's 10 rounds, period. You don't shoot 10 rounds. You're never going to shoot efficiently and you're never going to win. So what's wrong? Why are we doing that? I don't understand why we're not a, thinking, okay, guys, let's, or even throw a couple of those in, but then let's go, all right, let's do some eights. Let's do some sevens. Let's give them some options to do that. And actually, they did that at this match in some stages. The problem was everything was 35 yards, so it ended up turning to a 10-round array anyway. Yeah. You know, some I mean, you Some of the early on, like, straight down range stages were like that, like, max 19 rounds, and there's two reloads in there. Yeah. Uh, max 21 rounds, and there's two reloads in there for production or the low-cap division. Right. So I tried to do that on some of the ones I designed, and I guess I can talk about yeah that let's now. yeah let's get into it so you, matt actually designed some stages he also designed the infamous 18 but but yeah so and actually he's the jerk who put them all out there no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> he designed so I learned a valuable lesson on this like yep. i've designed stages for matches before and everything and not for this setup crew and this setup crew is used to having lines on the bot and on the stage to show like designate 
how far targets are from the back burn. Stage 18, which is stage 17 in the matchbook, they added that build drill thing, so it threw all the numbers off. I designed that, submitted it. The farthest target on that, that stage is 23 yards. So that back target is at 23 yards in the SketchUp. The farthest target, like during the setup, was at 35, I think. So they added 12 yeah. yards to the distance on that. Yeah, stage. I think it was 34 to 35 it. yards on the money. Yeah. Yep. And there was a piece of steel, I think, that was either equal to or just a hair farther than that. And if yeah, you put the angle, the angle into one. it, yeah. Yeah, depending on where you shot it from, it yeah. got farther and farther away. Yeah. If you were straight on, then you had a chance at 30 yards. Yeah. Anything to the right, you were adding another 10 yards because that was that far, much far. It was completely on the far right. You could shoot it, and that was it. Yeah. So, so. I'm going to add grid lines, like uh, markers that are basically yardage lines. Like So every line is a yard. Yes. So And it'll just be baked into the bottom of the stage it's going to look like there's a grid line on it yeah i'm going to do that from now on basically for any any stages that like i design or submit for people for setup it, it makes the setup easier too probably but i base stuff on walls right like, like an a foot wall is kind of the standard so that's kind of what i design stuff off of so they nailed that stage other than distance i mean we've talked about yeah. it we you had the design right in front of you and you were like dude yeah. They crushed the stage like the walls were perfect, the, the the main shooting area. But then it was like, uh, yeah, I didn't put all this distance out here. I said, Matt, why'd you do this to us, man? You're shooting production. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you think I would put this shit out here and I'm the one shooting irons? No way. <laughs> I, I didn't think like I didn't think I set it up at that distance. Yeah. And, and I was like, man, I don't have my computer i can't look at it like i couldn't tell people at the match but like when i came home i i looked at it like it's 71 <laughs> feet i have it marked in the sketchup file now right. i put a distance on the marker and then i like forwarded the the sketchup file to walt he was kind of there for setup so he right. could see it like the unedited one like i right. didn't like save it and then send it i yeah. sent like forwarded him the email i sent to jake right and so he could look at it and see that but he's gonna help me add the grid lines for the the templates and stuff so yeah that's good so I, um, that kind of brings up a subject that I'm glad we, you, when you talked about that, because, and I tell people this all the time. And actually there was a conversation that people were having online about, you know, how hard the stage was or whatever, and how it works is it doesn't matter what that piece of paper says. <laughs> that piece of paper can say, I want every target at five feet. <laughs> and when you put it on the ground, you can stand in one spot and shoot everything. Guess what's changing? That five feet. Those targets now have to be moved and adjusted. Yeah. And that's one thing I, I am comfortable with. It's yeah. as soon as like I submit those stages and if I'm not there for setup, like they, they can yeah, do right. what they want. Like, yeah, right. You you have no more control over it at that point. It's like getting on an airplane. It's like you as soon as like you get in there and like you close the door, you have no control. Yeah, that pilot hates his day. He's gonna make it a shitty ride or <laughs> the last ride. Who knows? You know. Yeah, right. But that's just the thing you sign up for. Yeah. That's uh, and that's the thing. It's like the guy who decides to have the flavor. They want their flavor on the match. Is what you're gonna get. Right. You're going to get that flavor no matter what. You're going to get that dude's flavor or whatever he likes to do. And again, I, 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 I never, you know, when people listen to us talk or listen to me talk about, you know, stage designs and, and where I have concerns, this isn't a complaint like, man, that guy sucks and, and he should never design. No, it's that the only way you get better at designing stages is by listening to different styles. We all have our own way of doing things. So I'm, I'm a big flow guy. I like to be able to move around and, and move through a stage smoothly. The funny thing is, is a lot of people think I only want to shoot on the move. I actually really like forcing people to stop, but I also want to be able to move and, and flow through a stage some in the same design. So in other words, I want to force you into that corner to have to shoot a 35 yard popper, but then I want to give you some two or three targets where you can shoot on the move to the next spot. What yeah. we've been missing at nationals is it's run to the corner, shoot some shit, stop, shoot some shit, run and nothing to do, but running, <laughs> get to the front, shoot some shit, run to the left, shoot some shit done versus there's no flow to where I can change stage plans. There's no multiple options on stage plans. And I think that's what we've kind of, so no matter how you design a stage, you can make that happen and make some changes. Some stages you are just going to have a stop and shoot 
process. That's all there is yeah. to it. And that's okay. That's, that's good to have those, but you have to like to understand that there should be some type of a flow to every stage, no matter what, right? Like the stage that um, I just listened to hit factor podcast. And a couple of guys were talking about the worst stage of the match was the one where it was a table start, sat on a chair, table start. Dude. That and, stage was so bad. It was terrible. And everybody shot that stage exactly the same. And if they didn't, yeah. they still went to the same spots. It didn't matter whether you started it the, on the far right, far left, whatever it is, you still shot them exactly the same way. That's the type of stage that should never, ever, ever make it into a Nationals because you're, you're literally creating – holes on the ground it's not there's nothing fun about that stage for a shooter because i i listen to so many people talk about that stage are like dude all i cared about was not getting a no shoot i'm like if that's the only thing you think about when you're shooting a stage that's a pretty shitty stage design because that's not, all not they put were no shoots no shoots no like shoots not, not airing one over the top of it either you know? <laughs> which i did and and it hit a no <laughs> shoot <laughs> Yeah, that stage was just, and not only that, but let's talk about the ground on that thing. That thing was like ice. I mean, you could, that thing was concrete underneath the rocks and every time they'd fill a hole in, it just, you slid across. That's actually how I ended up hitting the no shoot. I slid as I went to pull the trigger because I was like, oh, cool. I'm on solid ground. And there was none. <laughs> that's that's one of the only feedback thing I would probably say about the RO staff. Like they were trying to rebuild the shooting areas. Every shooter or every couple shooters made it worse, made it slick, made it way slicker. Yeah. Yep. Like, cause those people had dug all that like pea gravel out and it was just a base layer. And yep. that was much more comfortable to, to shoot on and move on and everything. That, that stage was really bad because I think people were shooting like close to the front and back and there wasn't like one solid path through the whole yes. stage where they stopped. So I think that was one of the reasons why that one was slicker. I had, I had, I almost fell three times at this match and I am pretty balanced. Like I pride myself on coming in smooth and entering. And I, I mean, I'm talking head up, like looking at the sky, almost falling on my ass. And I'm like, dude, this is great. Like I, I got to the point where I kept my finger out of the trigger. Cause as I enter, I always prep. I had to keep my finger out of the trigger guard because I was like, I'm going to let one fly here because I don't know what the ground's going to be when I get there it's it's really it was getting a little concerning i mean todd jarrett ended up having a piece of brass go all the way through his hand like and to where i think he ended up having to get stitches in his hand it was crazy because he fell on uh, the same stage i almost busted my ass on it was the build drill stage the stage the there was a stage where you would start unloaded start and run to the left if yeah. you ran to the left corner it was ice like you couldn't there's no speed you could enter on that you didn't almost fall off uh, i mean I, I can't tell you how many guys almost fell on our stage and that was a really dangerous position for people coming into it. The target was almost a 180. Uh, it, it was very, it was probably one of the closest targets to the 180 yep. for the match. And yep. you were running from right to left and having to load your gun. So all <laughs> right hand shooters had a super, like an extreme yep. risk on that stage of yep. breaking the 180 if they weren't careful. I actually ran left to keep myself from breaking the 180 coming up range. Because every time I walked it, I was like, point your gun at the target. And I was like, dude, if you mess this up, you could get called for the 180. So I didn't want to take the chance. I was like, I'm just going to run left. And then I can guarantee myself I'm always going to run forward. Well, I almost fell twice on that stage, <laughs> running into the first position. And then when it came to the far right, I slid again and almost fell on that one. I was like, oh my gosh, dude. Which, you know, for me, I'm thinking, this is killing my time. You know, I'm not worried about hurting myself. <laughs> I'm just thinking I'm losing time. But I was like, man, the first one, when I came in, I was like, wow, that one was really close to busting my ass. I, I, I mean, I, I had one foot up in the air oh, wow. uh, and I could see nothing but daylight, baby. I was like, here I go. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm seeing a whole lot of blue sky when there was nothing but a piece of wood in front of me just a minute ago. So it was, uh, it was getting really slippery out there for sure. Okay. Um, so stages on the ground. Um, let's talk a little bit about how many did st stages you design with one berm? I had five. And I had, had five, five of those? in a match with one berm. I okay. think I submitted eight, though, total to them with one berm. So they picked five okay. of them. Nice, nice. Do you remember those stage numbers? Yeah. Uh, two, three, six, seven, and eight were the ones in the actual match. It would have been two three, five, six, and seven in the matchbook. 
Okay, so you so you didn't do number eight on the on the matchbook. Or Correct. so no, no, not matchbook. So the far right stage of the the one berm, you did that one with the uh max trap with the headshot. That was stage eight, nine, I think. That would have been nine at the match, eight in the book. So you did that one. I did not know. Oh, okay. Darn. Was I was hoping not, to ask you I some did. questions about that stage. Okay. I did five, six, seven in the matchbook. Oh, five, six, seven. Okay. What did you think of stage number nine in the uh at the match? I thought it was like, good. as a production as a production shooter. I mean, it was a it was a simple two reload stage. Uh everybody basically like all shot from the left and then loaded in to the right or right left. Um what did you shoot? Do you go left to right or right to every, left? All our, our all our, our squad went left first. Okay. Because I don't know why. Did you skip the back steel? Yeah, we all skipped the back steel. So yeah. that put pressure on your round count on the far right then, right? Like you had nine I think rounds? We were like... nine at the end, yeah. Okay. So did fine. you take did you take mini popper then the activator or did you take the headshot? I took I shot the activator popper on the right. Yeah, did you take that and then go right to the activate? I'm sorry, I messed that up. Did you take that popper and then go to the far right paper or a piece of paper and then the activator, or did you take the activator immediately? Uh, far right paper and then activator. Okay, so you went paper, activate, uh, sorry. Shell. Yeah, steel, uh, piece of paper, uh, and then the, the clamshell. Okay. Yeah, no so problem. Was it pretty slow? Did you feel like it was slow? I, I felt it was comfortable doing that. Some people Good. on our squad yeah. had to go straight to the clamshell. Right, right. I think it just depended on how comfortable people felt yeah yeah i it was um i wish they would have given a little bit more of the headshot i probably would have maybe done the headshot but i uh it was impossible in my opinion to shoot that safely because <laughs> they tell you almost no head at all at that distance too they that was a pretty far like headshot they they were gonna punish you for that miss for sure on that yeah, not oh just yeah. round count that was that was another thing i didn't understand about that stage you're already hammering people with the round count and now you're gonna screw me over with a headshot <laughs> uh with a t with a no well, shoot in front of it that one ended up being more rounds than that it was still 16 rounds though yeah now i i really like that stage i just I thought it was like as a low round count shooter, like if I was shooting low rounds there, I was like, man, they just give me something in at, this at that match. Point that... In the match though, like going yes. to that many rounds on a mag with right. that distance stuff was right. was common. Like I had no concerns yeah. about that at all. Yeah. But you so. would have if you started there. <laughs> yeah, that's it, what been, I think. It, it, it took you a while to get story. used to the shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> think about who started on that guys who started on that stage. Uh, you know, it's like, those are kind of things like started on eight people were starting on 18 with the 30 yard steel. And I'm like, Oh yeah. man, I'm so glad I had a couple of warm -up <laughs> stages. Same here. Yeah, same here. So, yeah. And you just don't know what you're going to get until you get there. That's another thing. It's not like you're planning like, Hey man, Oh, cool. I'm starting on 18. No dude, you just got hammered. <laughs> you never really know what you're going to get because you, I mean, the matchbook doesn't really tell you hey this one's hard practice 30 yarders you know and stuff also like that on this one all the stages were offset by one because they threw in that builder yes that wasn't in there. So right even right. if you so, thought you were starting on 18 they're like oh that's an easy one it's a short one yeah, nope, yeah. Fuck nope. You. <laughs> you're getting hammered dude yeah yeah th there was um that's another thing is like not being able to shoot. I, I noticed now that I had that super squad taste in my mouth at, at PCC nationals, I really did not like not shooting with my competitors. Um, I couldn't really keep track of those guys at all when I was shooting because we were in two totally different scoring zones. And with me being in zone three, I came out of the gate like, hell yeah, I didn't have a single mic. I didn't have any deltas. I shot really good. Well, actually I did have a delta on day one because of a, Stage 18, I slung one at a 30-yard <laughs> piece of paper that I thought I pulled a mic on, but I was excited about that Delta, to be honest with you. So I, I got out of day one with not a single penalty, and I was like, hell yeah, I shot that really well. Just You just don't know until you have other – like those guys – either beat my time or were super competitive, but they also had my scores to go, okay, cool. Like I can go or not go depending on what they saw in those stages. And they had a couple days of the match kind of getting more settled in. It, 
I think Dude, that matters, honestly. I think it if I would have been able start. to shoot that zone in the last day, I would have murdered that zone because I, I was like, all right, cool. I'm dialed in for 30. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like it was comfortable yeah. after two days of it. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. And you know, it's just like Max and, and the guys that, you know, um, KC and, and trace those guys shot really well. Like I felt like I shot really well. So it was like, all right, cool, man. Like we all, we all shot well just max shot fucking really well. Like that guy just yeah. absolutely was dialed in. I watched him shoot a stage uh, or I, I saw one of his times that I shot against him. I'm like, yeah, dude, I crushed. I had one Charlie and I go to the pad and I'm like, you shitting me. This guy still beat me. Like what the fuck? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he just, he's good. And he, he just absolutely was dialed in for, for that long distance stuff. I mean, I'm sure that, that where he lives is a big advantage and what he shoots normally is the long distance stuff. So it's, he knows, you know, he's used to that for me. I'm still trying to figure out, I'm just now starting to understand that 20 to 25 yards is I can shoot it fast uh, and accurate. It's just, I I've taken me some time to catch up to that for sure. Um, even with my rifle, I'm like, all right, cool. 35 yards, no big deal. But he's, I mean, he's shooting it twice as fast as I am. I'm like, dude, I should be crushing. No, what? <laughs> he's just good at it. But um so uh, the thing that I'm, I want to, uh, I guess the biggest thing about the match is how, where do we go from this? Like, are they, are we, should we expect them to hammer us more like this? Or do you think well, they're going to understand that people are just, uh, I, I cannot expect a single person that shot production this year to go, cool. I'm ready to go back to this again next year. Well, I think this is an interesting kind of segue even though I don't think you meant it to be um, during the members meeting there was a lot of questions about who's running 2024 nationals who's in charge of it who's doing that uh, I'll just be honest Jake basically straight up said he is no longer going to do anything with nationals it'll be the new president's roles and responsibility and this is the last nationals that Jake is going to run now there's other thing, like, we don't know what the board's going to do about Yemen getting in that position and winning uh, the presidency. So the board could turn around and say, Jake, we still need you to do it. It's some, like, we need someone that's that can start now and work on it. We, we don't know anything about that. So Jake could come back. We know we're at least going to Ohio for CO Nationals. Uh and then we'll be in Alabama for everything else. Uh, at this point, I think you got to expect some distance at Ohio. You just have to. Like, yeah. they have – realistically, they could put 50-yard targets, like, on cross <laughs> shots on those long new bays. Yes. And be comfortably with inside the sideburns on that easily. Yeah. I just looked at the diagrams, and and I drew them up in SketchUp. Like, you could easily get – 50 yard shots on both sides going angles on those new bays. If somebody really wanted to put a 50 yard, multiple 50 yard targets on a field course, they absolutely could. Way to go, Matt. You just talked him into it, bro. <laughs> I mean, I could design another one like that if you want me yeah. to. <laughs> so to me, I don't, I don't mind some long distance. I, I mean, honestly, I really did like this match. I, I just, I, I just don't understand why you would just do it on every stage. Like even some of the, the, the bays that were just like one berm, you still had a shit ton of distance on it. just, it didn't make sense to just hammer everybody over the head with it, especially with iron sights. So, and I'll add this because I want to go into the members meeting still. Yeah. Um, I want to add this. And this was kind of one of the most kind of comical things. There's quite a few guys that have a lot to do with Ohio that I really like there. And I'm not going to mention their names, but I really like a couple of the people that work, and, and run matches at in Ohio. I mean, they're some of my favorite people in the sport. And I had multiple people, multiple people come to me and go, hey, man, this match was designed way before, <laughs> way before we actually put it on the ground. So these stages were here and ready to go uh, way before limited optics was added. And I go, yeah, I understand they were designed, but they weren't on the ground. So you right. could have easily said, hey, I'm going to take some of these 30 yard shots and throw some out there, but I'm not going to make this a 30 yard match. <laughs> so again, whatever the paper says is a guideline. It's not the rule. It's not the law. 
I mean, it's it's that's part of when you send stages into Troy for your design, he looks at it and he goes, okay, cool. He wants it to be close, but there is a lot of leeway with that. There's also a good example is, did they get proper clearance to put the build drill stage in? Did they get proper two, three months to get that cleared? No, it's when there are things that pop up like nationals, obviously they are the ones in charge, but they looked at it and said, Hey man, we can throw this build drill challenge in there. Cool. We got room for it. Let's make it work. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing, I didn't have a single problem with that stage being added to the match. Not, not at all. So the fact that you can make some changes here and there, as long as you don't go crazy and just design this totally odd, <laughs> oddball stage that was never sent in, then it's not an issue, but don't, don't bullshit me and tell me that, you know, you didn't make this harder because of, of optics. I feel like some of these targets were definitely put on there because of the guys that were shooting dots. Uh, so one thing I want to look up, I haven't done this yet, is are these in the in the, the stage library? Like, are they submitted to good the standard question. 990 process? I, I don't right. know if they are or not. I wonder if they're in there. Yeah. Well, if they were, you could go off the, you probably have grid lines. Is that what you're thinking? No, no, I don't think they do. They, oh, okay. I think they just yeah. upload this, the PDF that you kind of upload into the USPSA website. Uh, it's I got a straight you. crossover. I got you. So do they always add those for every match? Are they trying to do that? So we have the a library. Lines? Yeah, no, no, no. But uh, do we, do the, you, does the USPSA add that to the library so that yeah. everybody has stage so they can always see those? Okay. A lot of the times they're uploaded to the library. Like as soon as you submit, you have to submit stages on the to for Troy or one of the NROI to approve. Right, right. Or one of the assistants. Uh, as soon as like they're approved, I think they automatically go to the stage library because a lot of matches oh, nice. will people will find the stages before the matches release them, and they'll kind of like download the PDFs and kind of put like a match book together before that. Like it happens quite a bit where they're on the stage library before the match book even comes out. Nice. I, I need to, do, I need to, I'll have to find the link and post that in the video because I don't think I've ever once, actually, I think I have looked once because somebody sent me stages that I was, I was like, how the hell did you get those? And they're like, Oh dude, it's already on the website. I'm like, so I have really? to happen here. Like someone picked a stage I designed and set up for free state in Kansas. And they set it up at a local match here. I was like, that stage looks oddly familiar. And it Dude, was the exact same stage. I remember when it happened. South Carolina sectional this year, when we ran South Carolina sectional, our match was already posted before we even posted the damn matchbook. And I was like, how the shit are they getting this? Like we yeah. haven't even <laughs> we haven't even picked them yet. We haven't even got them approved yet. And they were like, Oh, it's on the website. I was like, Oh. Well, that's not good because <laughs> we were trying to keep people from building them. Well, I personally don't care. You can build whatever you want because you're not going to match what we build anyway. But it's just hilarious because uh, Todd was like, I don't want anybody practicing this stuff. And I go, dude, it doesn't really <laughs> matter. It, it just I, I doesn't really matter. So. Here, so okay, have... awesome. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send that out when I uh, when we get off or on, when I post up the video too. So that'd be great. Um, Yeah, so I, I just... It's always interesting to me when we get stuck on what's on the paper and then the, I see so many people printing out the matchbook and they've drawn all their stage plans and then they walk up and go, this isn't even close to the same. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. Like you're not always going to have it match the matchbook. I mean, I carry out PCC and open nationals was terrible for the matchbook. They weren't even close. Like. Mm -hmm. It was ter dude. I the last podcast I did, I was sharing the screen, and I'm like, uh, this isn't the same. This isn't the same. Not even close. Uh, forget what this thing actually says. It doesn't match at all. <laughs> like there was so much that they changed, and I think they did it for the better. They took some hard cover off some targets. There was a couple stages that were just like hard cover heavy. Like you could have never got flowing on that stage. And when they took them off and they just put them in specific spots, it really made that stage great because it was like, oh man, you can get rolling. But if you keep rolling, you're going to get screwed. So they did a good job on that. This, this match, it was just a hammer to the forehead all the whole time. It just, it really was. They never gave you a reprieve. Uh, I, I can't remember one single stage where I was like, yeah, man, that was, whoo. 
I didn't have to aim as hard on that one. (laughs) (laughs) So even some of the closer stages, dude, they would, they'd ramp you up and they'd throw a no shoot right in the middle of the target. Like where you're like, Holy shit, I'm going to hit that. And I had to go up, you know, it's, it's, it was just kind of the way the match was set up. So it was, uh, it was good though. I, I, like I said, I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed the match, but okay. Um, Let's get into the members meeting because I'm excited about the members meeting for a couple of yeah. reasons. One, I didn't go. That's why I was excited. So everybody has never gone before, right? No, I've never gone before. Okay. So this was there's, your first one. No, I didn't go. You didn't go? I didn't go. Nope. But there's a reason why. <laughs> I'm probably not. Said. No, I didn't go. Okay. No, we okay. talked at the house afterwards. That's okay. how oh, that's okay. that's how okay. I found out about everything. There's probably a reason why I shouldn't go. <laughs> I'm not good at not saying what's on my mind. I'm I'm much better off just not going and being involved well, at that level because I'm not good at it. A lot of people said what was on their mind at this meeting. A lot. And that's good. I'm really glad. So there's a couple of things that I really am uh, excited about at this members meeting. So I'll let you get into the members meeting. But there was some pretty big names that some pretty big volunteers, guys that have volunteered in this sport way longer than I've been here that actually stepped up and spoke. And I was really glad to hear that um, their frustration is my frustration. And and uh, a lot of us are starting to agree <laughs> it, <laughs> on the a, sport. It, it was an interesting meeting because, uh, like, how detailed do you want me to be? Let's go. Uh, listen, the most important thing to me is that it's factual. Other than that, I again, I'm here to yeah, listen to so, what you thought. So, like, the meeting started out. Um, I believe they talked about some stuff, but it was very, very quickly into questions from the members. Uh, like the first question was like, who is in charge of 2024 nationals? I think that's a good question. (laughs) It's a great question. Like we're already probably late on the June nationals and CO nationals at this point. Like there's some stuff to ask to, you got to start working, you know, you know, like 12 months ahead of time. And so if you South Carolina, couple, maybe, maybe, maybe you can go six, eight months ahead of time. If just to give everybody, team. just to give everybody insight when we run South Carolina, Matt is a big part of South Carolina also because he, well, it helps that he moved here and that's so awesome for us. <laughs> well, I don't live in South Carolina, but I helped my buddy Todd Holmes. Matt's a big, big, big part of our match. And we start the day we finish the match, yeah. we start getting prepared for the next year. So, we're a sectional match guys. We're not nationals. So there, let's just say whatever we do for the sectional, which we do a lot more than most, uh, they probably double or triple that for nationals. Oh yeah. Easily. So yeah. It, it, it matters. <laughs> so, so the question was asked, like, and it was basically said that that's kind of when Jake stepped up and said, he's not running it. He elaborated on that further after the meeting was done and basically said, he's not, he's not going to do anything for nationals for next year. Um, I, I think someone on the, on the table that, so Bruce Gary area one, Russell Forty area eight, Donna Webb. And then there was Jake, Rick and Rick Bratzel and Troy were sitting at the table. No one else was there. Ted Murphy was at the match. I thought, right. But he, he didn't show up to the members meeting. He, they said he was sick or something. Um, and then there was a zoom call. Paul found out later on that some other board members were in attendance, but they never announced that at the meeting. Uh, basically, I don't know who exactly said it, but the president, like the elected president is going to be in charge of that. And then like it, the question got brought up again, like, well, who is that? Like, we don't know. And then it got into like, why was Yemen put on the ballot if he's not eligible to be president? Uh, a lot of questions like back and forth between the people that were talking and the people that were at the table asking like what the process is, who's in charge of it, who's going to do it, like what has been done already. And basically they have the contract signed for food range and equipment. And that's about it from what I could tell that's been done. That's kind of concerning for the early nationals. Uh, I don't think they're going to like let them just fall apart, like where they can't be done. But at some point there, someone's going to have to step in and say, hey, like who's in charge of it. The board probably needs to make that decision in a hurry. And it's going to depend on how, what they do with Yemen. Like, are they going to allow him to go get recertified? Is uh, 
the people that are certifying ROs going to allow him to be get recertified in that? Like, are they going to say that he's good enough and changed and everything like that? I There's rumors about that. Like, no one really knows what they said they're going to do or what they're going to do. Uh, that went back and forth. Um, then an interesting thing happened. Like, someone was up there talking and then, like, asked all the staff that was working the match there that was in attendance to the member meeting was like, how many of you are willing to work for the newly elected president? And I think from what I could see on the left side of the room, there was two people that raised their hand. And then Bruce Gary stepped up and said, I'm, I'm willing to like put my differences apart from like the person there to actually like work the match because it's the nationals and stuff like that. So essentially three people from what I could see said they would work the match for Yemen which is very interesting to me. Your thoughts? My my issue is, and this is going to happen to no matter who the president is, okay? Yeah. It doesn't matter who you put in that position. If they've never ran a nationals, they're in big trouble. Like if they've never ran a level two or a level three, they're in big trouble. Um. Hell, if you've ran a level one and you haven't ran a level one, you're in big trouble. Yeah. I have ran a level one and I have participated in a level two. And I would honestly call South Carolina a level three, even though technically it's not because the way it's ran, um, the way Todd is organized, the way the sponsors we bring in, the things that we bring into that match, I would say that we are at a level three effort with a, level two number. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would um, say that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand how no matter who you are and what your opinion is on who the president is or whatever it is, how you can expect someone to walk in and put on a nationals if they've never done it before. But we also don't have a single system in line to bring someone in to teach them because it's always personal. It's always, I hate that guy. I don't like that. It's always got to do with personality conflicts in this sport. It's amazing to me. So I I'll start off with this. Jake should never have ever been running nationals. He's not the president of, of the USPSA. So the fact that that is his job title or has been for the last four or five years since I've been here or three years. Dude, I think it's been, like, I think it's been five years. Probably so 2017 is. is the first match. Right here, Jake. Uh, right here, Jake, bro. You shouldn't have that as your job. Your your job is marketing director. So the fact that you have stepped up and taken care of that for five years, what sucks is that we don't, we have so much bullshit drama that we can't get past keeping a president for the last three years. What the shit are yeah. we doing? <laughs> yeah, it's been bad. Jake's, Jake's done a great job. Like as many faults that people have found, like, the nationals have happened. They've happened every year. They've been, they've been pretty good. Like little, like people are nitpicking stuff out of it at this point. Of course like, you can always do they, that. And they've corrected it all at some, yeah. like, it's not just a, the toilets aren't overflowing match after match <laughs> yeah. after match. Like they fixed that as little, right. as much grief as he got for that. That was kind of, it was, it was the first year at that range for nationals. So. Well, and I, and I will say, so. and I will say, this is how it works. So I did my first year with uh, Todd last year. The, yeah, no, this year was the first year I did South Carolina. I learned a lot from my first experience running the vendor area. I have lots and lots and lots of ideas for this sport and how to make things grow. I came from a sport that the vendors kick ass. They make a shit ton of money in paintball because they show up and they have, they let people touch things. That's how it works. If you let people touch things, even if they already own a gun, they will buy another one because they get to touch it. That's how it works. Yeah. Even if they don't want the damn thing, they'll be like, Oh dude, I gotta have this. This thing feels so good. <laughs> it's just, we are, we, that's how we are as people who own guns. I mean, there's a reason why people own multiple guns of the same caliber, the same color, the same look. It do, It's just, oh, cool. Oh, a SIG. Oh, awesome. oh, a Canic. Awesome. Dude, they're both nine millimeter. Doesn't matter. They're different. I love it. You know, it's, it's just how it is, but we don't, that's some of the stuff where you learn like, oh, if I get the vendors here, 
I actually will sell shit for vendors and then the vendors will make money and they'll go, oh, okay, I want to keep coming back to your match. I want to donate a gun this time instead of just a grip. I want to, uh, I want to bring more ammo to sell and then I'll give some ammo away. And then the sport grows and grows and grows and grows. We can't get out of our own way half the time though. And that's the part where if you're always, you're always learning then that's, and you're, and you're growing, that's one thing. But when we get stuck, which seems to be what's, what happens a lot of the times in our sport is we get stuck in our, in our own way with the drama, right? Like, think about it. Jake's busting his ass. He's, he's planning something that's not even in his job title. First of all, like if you don't know that Jake's not supposed to be running nationals. Okay. <laughs> the president is. So once the president is out of the scenario, why don't we have the board of directors stepping up and running it as a group? Why does it have to be dumped onto one person? Why doesn't the group go, okay, guys, I'm going to take this part of nationals. I'm going to take this part of nationals. I'm going to take this part. Of you want to know how I know that works? Cause that's what we do in South Carolina, Matt, you tend to do all the stages. We all send you serve. We all send you stages. You look them over. Like I like this, this, and this. And then you call me and Todd and you go, Hey guys, what do you think of this? And we sit down and we have a meeting and go, okay, cool. I like this. I don't like this. Yeah. I want this. I want that. Cause Todd at the end of the day is the final say. And we have that in our sport with the president. But if we don't have one, we need to uh, appoint one to make that happen, right? So now we sit down, we have that conversation, and then we figure out all stages. And we go, okay, cool, send them. We're going to send them. That's what we're going to agree on, and then we're going to do. Then I sit down with Todd, and I go, hey, man, these are the vendors I got coming in. This is what I want to do. This is what I, I have here. I need this, 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 and this. And he goes, okay, cool. I can give you this, this, and this, but I can't give you that. We, we don't have room or whatever it is. I call you. I go, hey, man, I need this contact for this vendor so I can try to get them to come to the match. Right? But I don't go, Matt, I need you to do all the vendors also and the stages and the this and the that. We work as a team, and that's what we've been missing, in my opinion, in our sport. I hope there's a bigger team than what we see behind it. <laughs> I don't, I don't see it. <laughs> I, I don't see it. I can't imagine. I, I just, I, I don't see it, man. I really don't. I don't see anyone with the amount stepping of events, up with the amount of events they put on. Like if that was one person's like full-time job, I could easily see that that makes sense. I agree, but it's, but that's why I said Jake's doing all of them. Yeah. All of them. It, it's insane. And then, you know, we had Yi Min and, and we were, he was supposed to do the open nationals, PCC nationals, handgun nationals. And Jake was supposed to stop at, excuse me, Jake was supposed to stop at carry optics this year. Yeah. And now Jake has, because of the drama, <laughs> has gone into handgun nationals, PCC and open. I mean, it's, I don't know, man. It just seems like we're just spinning our wheels because of drama. Like it's always just effing drama. It, it gets very old. <laughs> it's like, where, when do the adults show up? Uh, so that, that was one of the things about the meeting that when you and I had a conversation that, and actually I listened to Brian afterwards from Hunter's HD Gold and, and to talk about the amount of people that showed up and not just showed up to listen or to complain, but to actually have a conversation, an open conversation about things they want to see changed was very refreshing. Very refreshing. I'm glad you said that because that's something I forgot about. So basically the first half of the meeting was about 2024 nationals. And then they went into the election, like the election results and there was some some information from the election company that didn't match the bylaws or what USPSA told them to put out. So the election company put out something that it was like the election was open for 24 hours longer than what they were told to put out and what the bylaws say. And so some people were in there asking, like, is it a, a, a legitimate election? Like, should it take place? And Donna basically got up there and said the election company had 12 people after the cutoff when the, the bylaw cutoff with what our bylaws say, 12 people try to go in and vote. And of and then there was an additional one person that reached out to USPSA HQ that couldn't vote. So there was a total of 13 people that tried to hit the link to vote or called USPSA. Uh, there were some people like that elaborated like, well, there was X number of votes and divided by number of days. So there could have been 160 or so people that that could have changed the election but that's not how the voting works like the voting it spikes on the first day and spikes when they send out the two-week reminder 
right. and then it's like little little values every other day <laughs> it's like when your buddy calls and goes did you vote yet <laughs> yeah or you hear it from a match or something or right. on a podcast you podcast know, that's yeah. that's like when you vote but i i think i've been told in the past that I, they can see like number of votes after that fact mm -hmm. uh, like when they're cast and everything so like right. the spikes are when uspsa sends out the email or elections sends out the email and it's a direct link to it so all they have to do is like click and vote and it takes like 25 seconds or something so all right so i think i think saying like the average daily vote count is enough to sway the election which i don't think that's the right way to look at it i'm sure there's some technical word like median or mean or something like and it's not that it's not even close to that because there's probably like three thousand people that voted on the first day and then you had like single digit numbers until the next email and then there's like probably another three thousand that voted that day and then single digit numbers until the end i think that was probably more common i haven't seen it i wasn't a part of any of that when i was yeah. on the board or anything so i have no no clue do you um, feel like the uspsa does enough to push the election like to really kind of keep it like in the forefront to get as many people to vote I think they do, and I think the people that vote, the number of people that vote or anything are pretty accurate on the number of people that are actively right. engaged in the sport. Yeah, that actually give a shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I agree. I'd say that's people that shoot more than, more than two, like, level one in higher matches like if you shoot a state match you're already included in that or yeah. area nationals all that yeah. i think there's maybe three thousand people that shot a level two or higher um yeah. it would be interesting to see the actual stats like we're working off of like some numbers from one of the anonymous instagram accounts to try to figure out like how many people are actually active and shot at what level yeah do you like, think it would be um... got solid numbers from that do you think it would be important for nationals to have a pad to vote, like have it set up to where when you register, you can say, Hey guys, if you want to vote and you haven't voted, there's a pad right here to you sign to, to sign in with your USPSA number and vote. That'd be interesting. I, I would actually think that everybody in attendance has already voted at that point. And I, I think they're one of the first people that vote. They're the active people. Like they're going to vote no matter what, no matter what yeah. election no like no matter anything so i waited till the end to vote like i was um oh definitely before the last day i promise you that right <laughs> uh but i i remember last the last election that some things were said that i disagreed with now i didn't change my vote because i had a personal conversation with that person but i didn't like some things that were said because they didn't communicate it the best so i and i knew that person pretty well so i was like hey dude like I want some clarification on this because yeah. you know i've had something like that happen to me personally and i really think that's some horse shit um so you know again i'm a man i go and have that conversation i don't go behind their back and go screw that guy i'm like hey dude what did you mean by this like i just and then obviously i have to believe you or not believe you but um i i want to hear that conversation so the 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 thing is is people are lazy right they'll vote if it's convenient and it's crazy how hard it is to go sign in <laughs> and then vote for a lot of people, right? It really is. These people are lazy and it's just not convenient for them. They're not going to do it. But if it's part of the registration for a match and you can just, you know, skip it, but it's there right in front of you, at least that pushes another opportunity for shooters to vote, whether they're whether they're involved or not, it might push them to go, huh, what is this about? Because I will say, I, only reason I know the majority of the shit I know is because I'm so deep into this sport. If you talk to your average level one guy who is a member, they're like, who's that? I, I remember when I first started, people would go, man, do you know who JJ Rakaz is? I'm like, nope. <laughs> they're like do you know who ben stager is or max michelle or any of these guys i go nope i'm not a fanboy and i'm laughing because i'm like i'm thinking like outside world like you know do you follow uh taylor swift i'm like shit no i don't follow any of those people right <laughs> not understanding who jj is in the sport and there's a co their coaches and this kind of stuff right 
So if I didn't know that, and I was deep into this sport in six months, like I was head over heels, I was in for life as far as I was concerned, and I didn't know who they were, then your average person who doesn't give two shits definitely doesn't know, you know, know about elections, doesn't understand how the process works. So if you push that, and I don't mean like force feed people, but if you go, hey, guys, there is actually a process to how our sport works and just make it a simple link when you sign up for a match. Even pra- I don't know, man, practice score has enough shit to deal with. But <laughs> when it's when you're signing up for nationals and you do your registration, it's a perfect opportunity when you're at when you've done your barcode scan. Boop. OK, cool. Then we got an election tablet right over there if you guys want to, you know, do your election. Uh, and, and vote for your president. Hurt. I think I think it would add, and yeah, it would be interesting to see how many of those five hundred, seven hundred people actually had already voted. I, I guess the other problem is, and and it's really easy to make ideas and then dump it off on someone else to have to manage, right? So now you got guys that are just deep in the shit at a match and they're like, Oh Jesus. Now I got to deal with this pad crashing or some jackass doesn't know how to sign and doesn't know his USPSA number. And I got to show them how to, how to vote. So it, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm like, man, that, that could actually work. But then I'm like, well, who mans it? Cause you know, someone's going to screw up and they're going to ask questions about it. I mean, I remember when I registered <laughs> this year at nationals and Jake was the dude standing at the table. I'm like, Jesus, this dude has 70 jobs. <laughs> Right. Like he's the guy signing people in and he's the guy that's in charge of everything or I guess as much as possible that he could handle that he didn't, it wasn't able to delegate. And he's the dude scanning the barcode. Yeah. Again, man, it's. The the other guy is director of it, like full-time job it created the USPSA app, created the steel challenge app. Yes. Manages the website, manages classification system, like created all that. And he's registering people for the match. And how you fix that is hire another person, which now means more money to someone else for us to bitch about. <laughs> That's taking more money out of USPSA's pockets. Yeah, it's so like I'm it gonna just... add a couple more things from the yeah. meeting real quick. Go so ahead. I I got up and asked like later in the meeting like where are they at compared to the budget since they haven't approved financials since May. Donna said they are behind. Uh, she didn't have the exact numbers at the time. I think everybody knew they would be behind. Like, I don't think anybody thought the budget they passed was actually accurate. So unlike the meeting in June where Ted said, yeah, they're perfectly on track. um, Donna said they were behind at this point. So that's just something to say. Uh, There were some questions from Tyler Turner. He got up there and talked uh, two different times and actually got into an exchange with Bruce, Gary, and Russell at some point, like Bruce, Gary accused him of asking questions for clout for a podcast that he runs, even though he doesn't run a podcast. (laughs) Uh, Basically, uh, Tyler asked like why the Area 3 director was removed and Bruce, Gary's opinion was he lacked integrity and was disingenuous, I think, were the exact words on that. Could be, but that was my opinion of what happened, so. Uh, uh, then Bruce Gary, like area one director admitted that the board violated the bylaws and allowing Mel to continue being on the board after he was not RO certified. That was a huge, a huge admission. I thought, and I, the deal with Eamon, like they removed him because he wasn't RO certified, but they allowed Mel to stay on for months at a time and then go get RO certified after the fact. I, th- I think they opened themselves up really bad at that point, like, and especially admitting it in a, like a documented member meeting, like they were recording the meeting. Like if someone wants to call like litigate them and subpoena that they have to provide it. And it's going to look really bad when a board member that was there for both of the votes says, yeah, we violated the bylaws and not kicking Mel out, but you did kick Eman out because of the same thing. Right. Um, like that's it not makes me it, it makes me wonder if when you see these they go into the um the private sessions that they have and they come out with a unanimous vote of yes of one guy disagrees it makes me wonder how many people are actually fighting and saying no but just to get the meeting over it ends up with a a unanimous vote type of thing to get it over with well i can kind of talk about that a little bit like 
in the executive sessions, like yes. there's no votes taken, but there's definitely surveys on like how people vote and like how to get to that. Like they don't take official votes inside those sessions, but they all agree right. on what they're going to vote on outside of it. Like when they get out of it, it's right. plain and simple. Like there's no hiding that fact. Yeah. Um, and truthfully, like until Scott and like, till I got on the board and then Scott and Frank, like there was no dissenters. They were all like agreeing. They all wanted to do the same thing. They all agreed on that multiple times. Like you can see the votes. There's very little dissent among the board for years at a time. And it's still like they have a majority. They have seven, well, yeah, seven out of the nine votes. Like they're all thinking the same way. And to be honest, like there's board members that have been checked out for years still on there. <laughs> yeah. Years. We're one of them, one of them is just about to walk away. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Replacing one this year, it'll be great. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I would. It's nice to have some fresh blood in there. Um, I don't agree with. Uh, we're talking about Ben Barry. He won Area Six. There's a lot of things I disagree with him, but I'm excited that um, we got some fresh blood, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah, the guy so volunteers. I I, I got to tell you, man, it's. I don't have to agree with everything someone says. I, I do respect the fact that that dude volunteers and puts the work in in his local area. And um, the only thing that scared me a bit, uh, actually something that scared me a lot about Ben was that he doesn't really go to the big matches. And I just think that that's so important. If you don't have a feel for what these guys are doing at the big matches, right? Like there is nothing like nationals. And I mean, from forget shooting. Okay. I mean, as a match director, the pure size of nationals to deal with the amount of targets. I took a video of the amount of note of hardcover <laughs> that they had stacked up. And I, I stopped Jake and I asked him, I said, Hey man, these targets that are sitting right here, what does that cover in the match? He goes, that is all the hardcover for every single stage and every two squads, we put brand new hardcover on. I go, holy shit, every two squads? Th guys, I want you to understand something. That was just the hardcover targets. There was probably 15 to 20 stacks of targets standing there. Because there's 21 stages, so you have to understand. <laughs> there's 21 stages of... Not every stage had hardcover, but damn, might, might as well have. <laughs> but... I don't think every one of them had it, but the build drill they didn't have hardcover. Hard except for the build drill. <laughs> no hardcover on the build drill. So I guarantee you. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you like every, almost every stage had hardcover on it. So that just the organization of that guys takes so, so much mindset of, okay, we need this many recovery targets in case something goes wrong. And then to keep it organized so people don't put the wrong target on the wrong stage, which gets stages thrown out. Don't ask us how we know that. <laughs> this is the stuff that people don't pay attention to. And if you haven't done a nationals, it's not that it's not that the matches ran different. It's the scale, the scale. And if you've never been part of nationals or you don't go all the time and you don't step back and go, holy shit, man, 21 stages of organization, the amount of staff and personalities that you have to manage for 21 stages of three to four ROs, holy shit, mind blowing. Like, yeah. so if you have someone who's in charge that everybody hates or doesn't get along with, that doesn't make for a smooth nationals. Just something to kind of put in people's ear. I don't think people realize how much work goes into these big matches. You're literally throwing a giant event. It's a corporate event that we shoot guns at. Yes. The food, setting up food, getting a vendor, getting a place to put the food and eat that doesn't charge us $10 million. It, it, I just don't think people know. They Staff really food on top oh. of that. Like that's a job in itself. And then the award yeah. ceremony is there's what 300 people that went to the award ceremony. That a one night event is a huge undertaking like for like that. People have jobs that just coordinate like one of those events a year yes. for corporations. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And also remember they've been there two weeks. They've been build, building stages, getting the yeah. shit on the ground. And then at the last day they come to the very last day and they're supposed to go, this is awesome. And, I'm having fun. Dude, I'm not tired. And then the last part of the award ceremony when they're like, 
okay, we're going to do the revolver division <laughs> first. So all the revolver people stand up and go to the prize table. Right. right. What do you think people did? Everybody ran to the table. Everybody stood door. up for every division <laughs> and went to the door and stood there and waited like cattle. Yeah. I was like, people can't fucking listen. So the best or- part is, is I stood up because I didn't want to sit anymore. Right. So I stayed way away from the doors. I was, I was like towards the edge of the table. So I wasn't anywhere near a door. And all of a sudden people come up to me and I go, I go, they go, Oh, there's Tom right there. And I go, don't follow me, dude. I'm just standing you're, here. You're the reason why people stood up. Huh? <laughs> I was like, they go, well, we know you shot limited optics. So we behind <laughs> you. So we're following you. I was like, don't follow me, dude. I'm just standing up. I didn't want to sit down anymore. I was like, don't follow me, man. I'm good. <laughs> I will say, and I don't know if these guys listen to the podcast or not, Yeah. but the easiest way to do that would have just been put signs up above those doors. But again, now they got to add extra shit to their job and make fucking signs. And and (laughs) on top of all this, like we've talked about Jake doing a lot. Did you notice who was handing out the plaques at the match? Yes. Jake was handing out the plaques at the match at the award ceremony. There was not a managing director there. There was not a USPSA president. There was not a single board member there that was handing them out. It was Jake that was there. Troy and Rick were up there and, and with uh, Mike, I think, right? Mike Howell going yeah. through the awards and yeah. announcing it. Rick was yep. up there announcing the awards. Yep. Jake was out there handing them out. Like those three guys were instrumental to having this match go off. So I, I want to bring something up real quick about uh, this is not off topic, but off topic from Nationals. Um, <laughs> uh, what's ru- what's Russell's last name? Area Russell eight- Fortney. Courtney. Okay. Yeah. So Russell became the area eight director this year by a landslide. No one really yeah. had a chance. He, he So I've known Russell now for at least I remember knowing Russell for the last two to three years, like really talking to him at every match that I go to. And I got to tell you, the guy is awesome. I like him a lot. He's always been straight up. I've had him have to make a couple of calls for me. And they didn't always go my way, but he's very honest. And he definitely goes towards the shooter. Like he's not trying to screw you when he walks up. And I've never once ever seen that guy get in an altercation with someone ever. Like, and I've seen some pretty bullshit calls where people are like, I got a double on this swinger headshot at 35 yards. And he's had to deal with, I've been on these (laughs) stages. Right. And I've seen him deal with it in a, in a polite way, but stern, like he has to be right. Cause he was a range master, whatever. And actually, it happened to me at Area 8. I disagree with a call, and he gave me a call. So I walked up to him at the end. I said, hey, man, I know it doesn't change it. I said, but watch where I shot the target from. And the RO said I wasn't standing there. And I showed it to him. He goes, yeah, you know how it goes, man. I Like, the hit looked great. He goes, but the RO said he saw it hit the wall, so I had to go with the RO. I said, listen, I'm not mad at all. I, you made the right call. You have to believe and follow what the RO says. So I was following something. I was watching something, and they started shitting on him online. Because he became a, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it had to do with not removing the RO certification for the president. Like making that still stand. He voted for yes, he, that that should be a thing. Like it should stand. It didn't, he didn't help remove it. Like in other words, they were changing the bylaw. They had a meeting about that bylaw, about removing that the president or board member has to be a certified CRO or, or um, RO. And he voted, keep it. Don't remove it. That's important, which I can't say yes or no against it, because I think if you are a member of the board, you should probably be certified in the rules that we uphold. That is kind of what the USPSA. That's one of the things you get when you become a member is the rules, right? Or they're all outlaw matches at that point. So I just want to correct it. So Russell voted area eight voted yes to remove that stipulation. So he wanted to remove the stipulation. Yes. Okay. Uh, so area two voted no. Gotcha. Area four voted no. So that's Ye- uh, Layden and then Mel from area four. And then our area director, Bruce Wells, voted no. So that those three means it did not pass. So they wanted to keep the, they wanted to keep the stipulation that they had to have the a certification. Requirement, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the funny part was, so I, I got that reverse. Sorry. When Russell voted that way, I heard people shitting on that guy left and right about, oh, you know, da, 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 board members this and board members that. And I'm going, that guy literally has been in there five minutes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all the hard work, 
all the comments that the guys, all the nice and all the hard work he's done is just out the window because he got voted in. And I, I talked to him at nationals. I said, Hey man, you're a real piece of shit because you're a board member. And he <laughs> died laughing. Cause he knew that I don't believe that. Like I I've talked to that guy so many times and he is awesome. He busts his ass for our sport. And I just don't understand where we've gotten to the point that if you're a board member, you're instant devil. Like it doesn't make yeah. sense. You don't have to. The thing when you become a board member is you're not always going to make the decision that everybody likes. That's one of the reasons why people have asked me like, man, would you ever run? I go, honestly, probably not because 50% of the people are going to hate your decision. No matter what I could literally like, Hey, I'm giving free memberships out 50% of the people are like that's bullshit, man. You're costing us a fortune. You just, you can't win because there's always someone that hates it or hates something that you do or hates something you say. I just want you guys to remember that unless you're willing to put your name on that line and you're going to volunteer for that position and put all that work in, shut the hell up or make some suggestions with solutions. Don't just bitch and complain all the time. It, it's getting old. I mean, it's getting to the point now where I don't even listen anymore. I turn them off. I don't want to hear it anymore because they're not bringing any solutions. It's always just negative, negative, negative. And it gets old because this sport's not really that bad. It's really not that fucked up, right? There's some people that are fucked up in this sport. And there is some people that just don't make good decisions as leaders, but that's vote, vote them out. That's the yeah. only options we got. And that just takes time. So, I mean, it is what it is. Unfortunately, it just, I just get so sick and tired of hearing about some of the hardest workers get so much of the shit, you know, it, it, that guy really works hard. <laughs> he's yeah, at every nationals. He's at all these matches. He works his ass off in area eight. I was at area eight. He, he busts his ass at that match. He was a range master at that match. I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. So, but, um, I don't know, man. I think that's about it. I just, I, I had to get my little rant out about him because yeah, no I, I, I saw him at nationals and I was like, bro, you <laughs> suck. <laughs> he started laughing. He just kind of like, I know, like I, I'm a piece of crap. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just, it was pretty funny because, you know, he's a pretty happy guy. You know, he's a yeah, pretty happy, yeah. good looking guy. So um, I, I do, I want to bring up one more thing about the national setup crew. Those guys work really, really hard. And I'm going to tell you, I, this match, I don't remember a single reshoot on our squad from a bobber, a popper, not falling over. I don't remember a single calibration issue at all on our squad. I didn't, obviously I only shoot on my squad. I didn't see any of the swingers have problems. I didn't see any of the max traps or anything. No fall lines <laughs> lifting up, no walls fell over. And we had some 15 to 20 mile per hour winds throughout this match, which tends to be Ohio, by the way, if you haven't been there before. Yeah. But the other thing was, and I remember walking up to Dan Bernard on day one, zone three, when we left that zone, I walked up to Dan. I said, dude, this has to be some of the best staff I've ever been around. Ever, ever, ever. I mean, I was like, dude, this area, this zone, now obviously I'd only shot zone three. But I was like, this zone has been amazing for ROs. Like, professional, fun, joking around, but professional when they needed to be professional, right? Yeah. Uh, just understanding that we're there for fun, but it's professional, right? You're there to be professional and do your job. And then when there's a joke, there's a joke, whatever it is. But it, it was the best staff I'd ever seen in a zone. And then when we went to zone one and two, great staff great staff like just they did a phenomenal job with even just how they put people together right even how they put people together obviously i'm sure there was some drama there always is at a match but <laughs> for for our squad we had a very good experience at on uh, with the uh, with the staff so and i think they did an amazing job this year with that match whether they people like the match or not i feel like the staff was amazing yeah it was it was very good and i think that's something that they've been trying to do like I think they saw the problems like in years past where some ROs were kind of grumpy or whatever. And they've, they've done a good job of like getting them out and not allowing them back into yeah. staff matches. Yeah. They're getting also, enough staff 
after quest where they can turn people away now that didn't used to happen yeah also uh good job troy you didn't get into an argument good job buddy <laughs> <laughs> You did good, man. <laughs> I saw that guy at nationals and, uh, you know, I, I'm always cordial with him. I've never had a problem with him. I know a lot of people have, but uh, I always give that guy shit. I'm like, behave, behave, you know, <laughs> like don't get yourself in trouble. So, but I mean, again, another tough job, you know, these guys have jobs that I certainly wouldn't want to take. Right. Uh, no way in hell. So I make my suggestions. And if anybody ever wants to give me a call or a message, I would absolutely, I would love to volunteer some time to uh, some some sponsorship stuff over there. Like I would love to do some vendor area stuff that I, I have some ideas that I think would be amazing for nationals, but you know, I'm not in charge. <laughs> I'm just here waiting for somebody to make that phone call, but you know, it is what it is, man. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. I don't, I don't think people realize how, I, I wonder how many people actually started the podcast and thought I was going to do nothing but shit talk USPSA and you as well. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be good. They're going to just trash USPSA the whole time. Oh. <laughs> We're vocal when we need to be. And I agree. We, we, we tell them when they do wrong and then we tell yeah. them when they do good. So I think the difference is for us is it, to me, it, I, I always want it to be a positive thing when the conversation is over. I never want it to be that these guys suck. They're terrible because they're not, they're doing a great job. There's just things that we could always do better. Right. I feel, you know, one thing Kyle Stevens said a lot in his in his stuff was you got to put the people in the place that that are are in those professions. So if you're gonna have a financial guy, put him you bring in a financial person. You don't bring in a, a hot dog salesman <laughs> to, to fucking run the accounting of USPSA. And I think that's some of the issues that we have right now is we don't have the proper people in the proper place. And I, I don't know. I can tell you right now, man, I've talked to a ton of people that have multiple professions that would just absolutely crush it in our sport that don't even want to be paid. They'll do it for free if they just get asked. But we have some pretty stubborn people in our sport. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and that's the issue. You know, you got thin skin and you got stubborn. You put those things together and there's a whole lot of drama in USPSA for sure. But <laughs> All right, brother. Well, I appreciate you having, uh, you know, have it coming on. And uh, do you have anything else you want to put out? No, I'm good right now. Thank you. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Um, all right, guys. So if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments. If you have anything for Matt, I will post his. Actually, put your Instagram and your other. What, how, what are your socials, Matt? It's Hopkins underscore shooting on Instagram. And I think it's just Matt Hopkins on Facebook. Make sure you guys slide into his DMs. He likes it. That's right. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, and uh, we'll see you on the range. Here at ProShock Products, our mission is to provide American-made quality products for all your firearms. We are a family-owned company of outdoor shooting sports products, sports shooting, hunting, and defense products, to name a few. We are proud to be an American-made company since 1982 and will continue to support all your firearm maintenance needs.